flow in the process of doing this oxidation transfers the electrons to oxygen to form hydrogen peroxide. Um, Jake's recording. Just so everybody is sitting there. Um, this, the enzyme that um, was the seed enzyme for this was from Scylo, Scyliobrinus horizami, which is a cloudy cat shark, which is a shark found in Asia. A little shark, 50 centimeters. It's an animal like that. Um, <clears throat> this enzyme, EC number is 1.1.3.8. The particular accession number is this. It's about 440 amino acids and about 51 kilograms. So, moderately sized protein. Little is actually known about its regulation. Um, it's actually difficult to study. It turns out. The overall pathway looks like this. Here's, here's actually where GLO is. It's the last enzymatic step in this overall pathway to form this ascorbic acid. The pathway starts with glucose 6-phosphate, which is the first intermediate in glycolysis, right? Remember, glucose comes into the cell, gets phosphorylated, that's glucose 6-phosphate, and that commits glucose to being used in the cell one way or the other. If it doesn't go into glycolysis, one place it can go is into ascorbic acid biosynthesis. Phosphoglucomutase um, transfers the phosphate from the 6-carbon, from the 6-hydroxyl to the 1-hydroxyl to make glucose 1-phosphate. GDP glucose pyrophosphorylase takes this phosphate, uses it as a nucleophile to attack UDP, with loss of pyrophosphate, that's two phosphate together, that's that, to make UDP deglucose. So um, glucose has now been attached to UDP. The next step involves two NADs, forming two NADHs in UDP glucose dehydrogenase, as you would expect if it's an oxidation. And what happens is this carbon gets oxidized twice, first to the aldehyde, and then all the way up to the acid to make UDP deglucondrate. So um, that enzyme does that, uses uh, two NADs, then UDP gluconeuridase hydrolyzes the sugar away from the UDP and gives you D-gluconeurate and UDP goes off and does its thing. The next step, the sugar gets reduced with uh, gluconeurate reductase. It takes an NADP and forms an NAD. NADPH and forms an NAD. The way that works, first the ring opens, and this is the open chain aldehyde version of the sugar. <coughs> then the enzyme oxidizes the aldehyde to the alcohol to make L-gulinate. And this is, it's kind of in its cyclic form and stretched out, it looks like this. If you notice, we've changed from a D-sugar to an L-sugar. But we haven't actually changed any stereocenter, which is kind of an interesting way to do this. What happens if you look at this, think about this. The carbon that was carbon-1 in glucose is the one that just became the alcohol. So it's been reduced into the alcohol. And the rule for a Fischer projection is the most oxidized carbon goes on top, right? That's no longer carbon-1, it's now carbon-6. It's what was carbon-6. So the whole sugar's been flipped over. And if you see these stereocenters, if this was upside down, it would be, the stereochemistry would be glucose, D-glucose. But we flipped it upside down, so carbon-6 of glucose is up here, and carbon-1 is down here, and the effect is switch all the stereocenters. So that's um, L-gulinate. L-gulonolactinase lactinase, um, takes this hydroxyl group and uses it as a nucleophile to attack the acid and make an ester, and a cyclic ester is an to the lactone. That's the substrate for GLO. <coughs> and GLO is right there. Um, so GLO is the last step, again, in this pathway to make ascorbic acid. Ascorbic acid and vitamin C is pretty important. We have to eat it because we can't make it. And the reason we can't make vitamin C is simply because this enzyme is reactive. There's just one. Um, so we have to eat it. This is true of other, most non-human primates. Um, some fish, some birds, bats can't make vitamin C and guinea pigs. I don't know why you eat it. Um, you need vitamin C to make collagen, and you need it for several other, several other pathways. If you don't have enough vitamin C, you get scurvy, and ultimately you die. I'll talk a little bit more about scurvy later. Um, the interesting thing, we have the enzyme, or we have a pseudogene there. So if you look in the rat, you see where GLO is. We have a gene that looks a lot like GLO right there, but it has several mutations in it that make it inactive. And this is true for the other organisms that don't have GLO as well, though they're different mutations. So it looks like um, different lineages have lost GLO um, independently. So there may be some advantage to not having glucose, um, glucolactinase, um, and not making vitamin C as long as you in terms of not making hydrogen peroxide, which is an oxidation reaction, cause oxidative stress, but that's not really true. Um, the mechanism is 
is not really well understood, but you can, you can guess that probably what happens, this is a lot like um, an alkyl dehydrogenase mechanism. So you pull a proton off the alcohol, the electrons kick down, that makes a carbon oxygen double bond, and then H minus hydride is the leaving group, which attacks the, a flavin, the enzyme which requires a flavin. Um, this is a FAD. The electrons go to FAD immediately. Electrons attack here on this nitrogen, electrons pick up, and it gets protonated at this nitrogen from an active site, histidine. This gives you the product of the reaction and a reduced form of the flavin. The flavin is kind of unusual for flavin enzymes. This flavin is covalently attached to the enzyme, so in order for the enzyme to do the reaction again, that flavin needs to get reoxidized. And this is where oxygen comes in and takes um, the two electrons that just went in off hydride and two protons to electron reduce oxygen to some hydrogen peroxide, the cofactor factor reoxidized and ready to go again. Probably a coupon mechanism um, with the ping reducing the flavor and the pong reoxidizing. The um, there's no structure of, of colonal lactin oxidase. It looks to be, it's thought to be a membrane bound protein, so those tend to be difficult to study. Um, but it's a member of a structural family called FAD dependent alcohol oxidases. And these are oxidases that all have FAD in them and all oxidize 5,6 um, carbon sugar alcohols, um, such as xylitol. These sugars tend to be linear, and the substrate for this enzyme is cyclic. So there's going to be some differences in how the actual substrate's bound, but we can use the other structures to get an idea of what's going on. Uh, if you look at alignment, there's not a lot of, it's not like blue like a lot of your other enzymes are, but there's um, some key parts that are um, conserved and that'll give us some information when we go look at the structure. <coughs> this is um, an alcohol oxidase from uh, Streptomyces color, which is as close a relative to GLO as there is. Um, and the flavin FAD is bound here, it's shown in yellow, and this is the xylitol bound. If we zoom a little bit, in magenta, this is the this is a histidine that's conserved in all of these enzymes. That's the covalent or the enzyme um, active site residue that covalently binds to the flavin and holds the flavin. And that's and there, and then there's the xylitol with a whole bunch of hydrogen binding compounds. Zooming in a little bit, here's that sugar again. Here's the flavin, and there's several candidates for the base in the mechanism I just showed. Me. Um, we don't really know what's going on for sure. Here's some candidates. Um, glutamate, or glutamate 320 and arginine 322 are both conserved in both of the structures and are near where they would be able to pull the proton off the one that has oxygen. Again, remember, for GLO, it's a cyclic substrate. This is a linear substrate, so there's going to be some differences around there. There's also a histidine up here that's also making kind of reasonable context, but this one's not conserved, so it's not clear what that one would be doing. Um, but one of these is probably the active site base. Um, the hydride would come off of one of the carbons around here, depending upon what the substrate is going to really be doing. Transfer onto the flavin to this position, and then histidine 372 is up here that provides the proton for the thing. And I can zoom into that a little bit. This is kind of just turning it. There's the sugar again, the flavin. The hydride goes on that position, and the proton goes up here, probably from that histidine 372, which is a conserved substrate. Um, so catalytic strategies that it uses, entropy loss is pretty common, the substrate binds. It doesn't look like it uses a lot of strain. Um, it seems like the substrates just kind of fit in like a lock and key, they just kind of fit in the right place. Um, Acid-base catalysis, the histidine and the glutamate, one pulls a proton, one provides a proton, so it's not catalysis. And proximity orientation, having all those things in the right place so the hydride can't be transferred to the flavor is going to be important. Um, scurvy, lack of vitamin C associated with and other mariners, because if you're out in the deep, if you're out in the ocean, you're anxious around a lot of fruits and vegetables, so you don't have a way to get vitamin C. Swollen gums, easy bruising, wounds are going to be able to fall out, because you can't make collagen, which is important for healing wounds, and you can use all that kind of stuff, and so um, so that's the Divide it up however you want. I recommend not alternating sentences. Oh, that's just <laughs> okay. 
But but one of you could take mechanism, one of you could take metabolism, one of you could take back or however you want to do that okay. kind of thing. Julia? Uh, where did you find the step-by-step -step mechanism for metabolism? Because it was clear. Okay. When we looked for it, it was part of other people. 